Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is Library Commission's weekly um, online event or online webinar that we do. Uh, we do these every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time live and they are recorded so if you have um, any that you want can attend live you can always listen to our recordings we've got um, two years worth now of Encompass Live that we've been doing this so you have lots of options out there um, we do various um, types of topics of here um, presentations interviews book reviews little mini training sessions basically anything that we think may be of interest to um, Nebraska librarians um, and we have commission staff that do presentations. We also have guest speakers, as we have today. <laughs> um, so today we actually have Murray McGee from uh, the National Network Libraries of Medicine, who's going to talk about uh, yeah, talk to us about emergency preparedness in libraries. Which, with all of the blizzards and floods and things that have been happening the last few weeks, probably a good time to talk about it. <laughs> Most people will t say there's no good time to talk about it, but yes, there's always a good time to talk about it. So thanks for having me, Krista. Um, I always enjoy giving these presentations because I think we can get to audiences that we may not always be able to get to. Uh, this was a similar presentation to one that I did at the L Nebraska Library Association, Nebraska Educational Media Association Conference uh, for Nebraska last fall. Uh, but it is a pertinent topic all the time. We need to be prepared and it's, uh, it's not always a topic that people want to be talking about. Mm -hmm. um, but I do represent the National Network Libraries of Medicine, which is the outreach arm of the National Library of Medicine. I am the Nebraska and Education Coordinator uh, for then our six state region as well and my contact information is here. Later on in the presentation I'm going to show you where you can get to this PowerPoint and as uh, Krista mentioned, there'll be this recorded version. Mm -hmm. for we'll have the, a link to the PowerPoint right. there as well, so you'll right. have a one place if you need to, if you want to, to go yeah. to both the recording of this and the PowerPoint yeah. yourself. I'm just going to wave. I just want to say, oh, okay, just want to just make sure I'm working here on the camera. <laughs> so that's great. Yep. All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. And if you have questions, we'll allow some time at the end for that as well. Mm -hmm. So please keep note of that. And one other thing, we do have a chat box there, and if you would please put your zip code in the chat box. I realize most of you may have pre-registered for this, uh, but we, uh, my reporting uh, requires that I have a zip code, mm -hmm. and so this is an easy way for us to get it. If you would please go ahead and do that now, mm -hmm. and I'll mention this one more time in the presentation. So yep, Just uh, in the box that says questions, open yep. that up and type in your zip code, and yep. our go-to webinar system will collect all that. Yep. Um, and then we'll just give that inf the zip code information to Great. Marty for reporting purposes. Okay. They're coming in. Okay, good. super. Good. All right. Well, let's see. That's not working. So let's, whoops. Well, it should. All right. Try space bar now or something. There ah, we space bar. Okay. Okay. Well, here are the things that we're going to be talking about, and I talk fast, and we've got a lot of information, but I'm always giving you the information of where you can locate this to look at it further. Uh, I'll be talking about the National Network Libraries of Medicine 10-step program, uh, being prepared at home and in the library, uh, what kinds of consumer resources you can direct people to, and what specifically can you do and get started on uh, even today. So first, let me talk about the National Network Libraries of Medicine emergency preparedness and resource or uh, response toolkit. Uh, this is a web page that's been set up uh, over the last couple of years and we have this 10-step program where you see the little red arrow pointing to this uh, at the top of the page. I'm going to be talking about that more because one of the things, if I only have one thing that you can take away from this uh, presentation, it's a um, it's a little sheet, it's a pocket response card sheet that you can locate by going to that where that red arrow is. Uh, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit more in the presentation, uh, but this is going to be a valuable resource and it's one place where you can keep a whole lot of information that you can have handy at your fingertips anytime. Uh, this is a very robust website. We've got uh, plenty of examples. We have stories of when people have talked about when they've had disasters in their libraries. There are toolkits. Um, down at the lower left-hand corner, you can even check on where there are particular problems today where there may have been emergencies. So, uh, as I said, very robust and worth some time in your exploration. 
So we're going to jump right into the, the 10 steps. Uh, the first one, obviously, is to assess your risks. And obviously, when we've got a lighthouse there, people have assessed their risks. And that's <laughs> certainly what you need to be doing, too. A lot of this is going to depend upon your geographical location. So let's look first at kind of the way we talk about some of these things. So you may have natural kinds of disasters. This is like a little score sheet that you can find from our website. Uh, there are natural kinds of disasters. I think those are the ones that probably come to mind first of all. So you have a tornado or an earthquake or a hurricane. Those all fall under that heading. So this little score sheet is going to help you assess how much risk you have in your community and what you should be doing to plan for it. You may have unintentional risk. Um, you know, something happens like a train derails and something spills into the community. Uh, that could be something. You can have intentional risk. That might be a terrorism kind of attack or something where someone does something in your community which pe puts people at risk. Or a public health emergency. So, um, you know, for example, a pandemic where many people are becoming ill at the same time. So these are all kinds of activities that um, actually impact libraries probably more than you think. And I think we learned a lot when Katrina happened because we really began to understand how libraries can become real hubs for people in emergencies and what kinds of things uh, libraries need to do to prepare for that. So this presentation is really twofold. It's really partly about protecting your own resources in the library, but also becoming a resource in your community, which again, I can't emphasize enough. The more you can prove to yourself or to your community how valuable you are as a library, um, that's only going to work to your benefit because then you get more funding, you get more attention, uh, you are really advocating for your library. So this is a win-win. Okay, well, let's talk a little bit about these. Here are natural disasters. You know, tornadoes may be the first thing that come to my mind because I <laughs> live in Nebraska. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Not on an ocean or whatever. So, um, obviously, we are aware of these kinds of things. And there is evidence. So, if you need to uh, tell your city planners why you need to be working on emergency planning or why you need to be part of the emergency planning team in your community, you can point to these kinds of resources. So uh, the first one there, I think that one was about um, uh, earthquakes, if I'm not mistaken. And um, on the lower right-hand corner, we have tornadoes. And so you can kind of see, and again, I'm using Nebraska as my example, but the really dark colors are the places where tornadoes are more uh, likely to happen. And you're going to give yourself X number of points for which part of the state that you're located in. Then you can see a lighter area and then kind of a yellow area, which uh, really doesn't get much in the way of tornadoes. But again, this just helps explain information to other people that we need to be concerned about this and we need to be prepared for it. Um, and if you're within a range of a river, so for example, uh, gosh, it's just really interesting to watch some of the flooding that's going on now. I was watching the things in Australia. <coughs> oh, now. Yeah you know, long ago, but whole communities can be cut off. Um, this one is also saying if you're close to the railroad track, that also is going to have um, some bearing on things. So again, things to keep in mind. Intentional disasters, here we're showing a crop duster, um, warns that anthrax spores released by a crop duster could kill more Americans than died in World War II. You know, it's kind of scary to read those sort of statistics, but again, unless we kind of think about them, um, we're not going to be able to prepare for them. Uh, also, cities have their own particular um, rating, if you will. Uh, it's more dangerous if you live around particular cities. You can see Omaha and Lincoln have their uh, areas of contention. I'm sure Omaha because of the Air Force the Air Base. Air Force Base yeah. up there, yep. Yeah, exactly. I always think we'll be slightly safer here because the Air Force Base is up there. <laughs> well, we like to think first. so, yeah. <laughs> So perhaps we will. They didn't really target these. I mean, they didn't really say how much yes. one city is versus another, but obviously an area of concern. Nuclear power plants, that's another whole thing. Uh, again, you can see that we do have a couple here in Nebraska. So you on that sheet, you'd give yourself 10 points if you were within 20 miles of a nuclear power plant. 
actually, I think it'd be more miles than that, quite yeah. honestly, but uh, something to start the ball rolling anyway. Um, fire and water damage. You know, we, we can think of a fire in a library, but honestly, the real damage comes from water. So here, an arsonist at the Los Angeles Public Library, and obviously this was quite a few years ago, but uh, many things were destroyed by the fire, but 600,000 volumes were damaged by water. Mm -hmm. So then again, you have to think about how do you recover from that, what sort of vendors do you need to be working with, um, how do you protect them from that. So the drying in this case cost $2 million. Well, obviously that was a pretty big event, yeah. uh, but something to be thinking about. So what's your score? So what you should be doing is looking at what your score is and how vulnerable you may be to things. So that's assessing risk. So now what about protecting yourself, your staff, your patrons? Um, well, here's a good example of a tornado that happened. Now, fortunately, no one was hurt in this, but you can see where windows have been taken out, where uh, cars have been turned over. You need to make sure that your people have an evacuation plan uh, so that they can harbor safely when, in the event of a tornado. Uh, here's a really interesting one that happened just uh, in 2009. The Cologne Archives building in Cologne, Germany collapsed in about three minutes. So I am thinking three minutes. Could I get out of my library in three minutes? I wow. think it might, yeah, it might be a challenge. So when you think about three minutes, it seems like a short period of time, but then if you time it, maybe that's it's not. Right. And that's why we have that's here, right. even in the Library Commission, we have um, fire drills. Same thing. Excellent. Time getting yes. yourself out. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And are you going the shortest route without using an elevator? Obviously, mm -hmm. because those could very easily be out of commission, and you wouldn't want to get stuck in one. So was this? A, is this an earthquake or it just collapsed? No, out of no, the blue? just the building collapsed oh, out wow. of the blue. As I understand okay. it, people started hearing kind of a creaking motion, right. and then, wow. Ooh, yeah. So uh, it was a it was a miracle. I think mm -hmm. that no one was hurt. Um, and what about a hazmat? hazmat incident. This would be, for example, if you had chemicals in your community. Do you have some place where you could go in your library that could function as a shelter in place location where you're not going to get fumes from something? And do you have the things to uh, make this more safe for yourself? So for example, do you have duct tape? Do you have some kind of plastic sheeting that can you can use for a door a window or a vent that go into those rooms. They're not mm. difficult things to have, and they're mm. not even very expensive to have. Mm. And one idea that I have heard is that uh, that you just buy a large garbage can and you start putting these kinds of supplies in that garbage can, mm. perhaps in your shelter in place uh, place. So it's, if it's in your staff lounge, for example, then you can have the plastic sheeting, the duct tape, if you have a crank radio, or flashlights or those sort of things, then you know where to go for that information and everyone on your staff should know where to go to. So does your staff know how to respond to a medical emergency? What if you have someone who looks like they're having a heart attack? Uh, has your staff had CPR, for example, or do you have a defibrillator in your library? If you do, do people know how to use it? Or are, do they know the phone numbers to call if you need to get paramedics to the scene quickly? So those all should be things that should be uh, reviewed again with your staff. And, and this should be done on a regular basis, too, and I think we need mm -hmm. to mention that. You know, you can do things once, but honestly, they need to be repeated many times. And you have revolving staff, so it's a good thing to put this into your schedule probably a couple times a year. So here are just an example of a few things that you might uh, ask your staff. Um, what do they do if a tornado warning is issued for the area? So you're not only concerned about your staff, but let's say you have patrons who are in the library at that time. Where do you take them? And is it a secure place that you can take them to? Um, security calls to say that a violent person is in your vicinity. Um, a patron rushes to the desk to report that somebody's having a heart attack. Well, we sort of talked about that sheltering in place, or water in the floor in the basement. That may not seem like a big deal, but maybe you have electrical things down there too. Uh, a construction worker says that you have that three minutes to evacuate the library. 
or it's Saturday afternoon and water is pouring in from the ceiling onto your reference books. I think that's a phone call nobody would like to have. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe you test them first by, gee, what's your first response to this? And then say, and here's what you really need to be doing. So how do you create procedures to ensure the continuation of your core services? And you, and you need to identify those core services. So you might think about interlibrary loan. Is that a big deal for you? For public libraries, it may be less important than it is for hospital libraries, for example. Mm -hmm. um, asking a librarian, what about your web page? Who's going to update that with information? Uh, is there information for proxies, troubleshooting, access to print resources? Uh, is there study space? Uh, again, things to think about. Um, there's a little brochure available off of our National Network Libraries of Medicine website, and it's called the Service Continuity Strategy. So again, this is a place where you can go to begin to think about some of the things you need to be considering. Um, I think the part over here on the right that says communication is everything, I think that is absolutely essential. You have got to prepare for that, not only in terms of notification, but even in terms of how you deal with the press. So um, I like that idea. So create procedures to ensure access to core materials. So you might uh, be also aware of this. The National Library of Medicine has actually been working with vendors because journals are so important to those of us who are in medical libraries. Uh, that certain vendors now have made an agreement with the National Library of Medicine that if there is a geographic emergency in an area, they will actually give free access on their databases to people who are affected by that emergency, which I think has been a tremendous initiative. That way we know if people do have internet access, at least they can get to these kinds of resources quickly. That's awesome. It, it is That's awesome. Great. I think that was really a, a terrific thing for the National Library of Medicine to have initiated. Um, the flip side of that is just to have a cart full of books that you think are going to be important. Obviously, again, these are from a medical library, but you probably have some medical resources that might be valuable if you had to take them out to a particular site if necessary. And what about developing a mutual aid agreement with another library or network? Maybe you live in a small community, you don't have much staff, um, and actually any library should set this up with another library. It's just like having a buddy system mm -hmm. so that if one is out of commission, the other one can sort of pull the weight for a while until the first one gets back up to speed. Uh, you can take it to a legal status where you sign something. This is called a mutual aid agreement. Um, it's Again, we have examples of that on our website, but I think this is a terrific way to ensure that you are working with someone else who knows libraries because you don't want someone to get in there who really doesn't know what's going on, uh, but someone who's worked with libraries and alternatively have worked with the Nebraska Library Commission, um, you're going to have the same kind of knowledge base. Uh, plan for the rescue recovery of your highly valued materials. Now, again, this might be important if you have some things that are very old or that you need to protect. Um, how have you tried to ensure that those things will stay protected? Are they in a glass case? Can you take something out of there? Can you wrap it in some of this protective, um, looks like plastic sheeting that has zippers on it, that's going to protect it if there's water possibilities of damage? Um, and what about developing your communication plan? As I said, I think you know this one should be first and foremost. So how do you notify your plan for your public and your staff? What are you doing for your library website? Because that is going to be the public face for people as long as they have internet access. What about social networking sites? If you have Facebook and Twitter, mm -hmm. how can you use those for Absolutely. emergency planning? Yeah, yeah. And further, talking to the media. You know, because I do think this is one thing that librarians don't do a lot of. They may not necessarily be prepared to do that. But if you wrote out maybe some scenarios beforehand and sort of practiced with that or had sort of a shell available so that it gives you some talking points to begin with, it's going to work to your favor. Note how to obtain outside assistance. And for this, whoops, when I say outside assistance, um, this also has to do with other uh, entities in your community. And I'm going to talk a little bit about more about this. 
because in Nebraska we have a couple of different things, uh, medical response teams, um, and these are set up regionally, so you can obtain outside assistance from them as well, and I'm going to show you where to get more information on that. Uh, and this is that little sheet that I was oh. talking about. We have a comment here, actually, that may be yeah. useful to some people. Yeah. Um, Erin Mockler, who's from Omaha Public Library, says that they're working on a live guide to provide information Excellent. to the public regarding emergency services in the area. So I you, think that's a library do that for their research and resources for Absolutely. use in the library, but they're doing it for that purpose. That's great, and maybe we'll have some things you can add to that today. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. All right, well, this is the prep plan, this uh, pocket response unit. And here, I'm, I know you can't see this very well, but here are some of the things that are included on this. So you would have your institutional contacts, which would be your director and the people who work in your library. You have, uh, perhaps you may have a disaster team that's uh, for your library. In bigger libraries, this might be more common. You would have your communication plan. So, for example, how are you going to get in touch with people? Do you have their information? Um, and make sure that you are including maybe not just their work number and their home number, but a cell phone number as well. If there's email um, or if you have a Twitter uh, account that you can feed out information to several people, um, that's a good thing to include here too. What is your service continuity plan? So what kinds of online resources are you really going to target to keep up? Um, what sort of online chat might you have available? Because people could do that out of their homes in theory. Um, the library's web page we talked about. What kind of print collection do you want to have available? Uh, who's on your service continuity team? Uh, some of the other things that you may not necessarily think about. Um, what do you necessarily want to keep for your collection? Those kinds of things that you want to protect. We sort of talked about that. But I think your vendor list. And I, I you hadn't really even thought about this. But if you had several different databases that you really wanted to target to keep up, who do you need to contact as your vendors? And you need to let them know that you're maybe out of service or that you need some additional assistance. A floor plan. Um, and you know, again, what the floor plan of your library is. But if you had to tell a fireman to go into the such and such room and turn off such and such, right. if you had a they floor plan available, then it's going to be a lot easier for you to do that. Um, and where else to get help? And again, this includes our information as well as whatever else you may uh, choose to put down there, including salvage companies. Mm -hmm. So if you had a fire and water damage, mm -hmm. that you could call those people immediately because honestly, working on those things as quickly as you can is going to be one of the more important things. So again, if you only take one thing away from this presentation, I would urge you and your library staff to fill this out today. It doesn't take much. And again, the advantage of this is it's just one sheet of paper. It can fold into a little piece like this that can fit in your wallet. So that's the whole thing is that you have it with you at all times. Mm -hmm. Or you at least have a copy at work, a copy at home. Mm, that's uh, a good idea, yeah. Right. But at least if you have it this way, You've got it with you, and you don't have to be uh, fussing around with, oh, where did I put that list? Okay, now being prepared at home, and this is kind of the other side of things. Um, Red Cross obviously provides some resources. You know, get a kit, make a plan, be informed. Um, there are actually several places where you can go for information. So the Red Cross provides information. The National Fire Protection Association provides information. Uh, Ready.gov provides it. FEMA provides it. Uh, what I like about FEMA, they've included one for how to prepare for your animals. Oh, yeah. So I, I, being an animal person, think that's a good thing to consider because you might not have. Just so you know, all of these URLs that are on here will be yes. posted when we put the re um, recording up. We put them all into our Delicious account. Oh, great. And everything, all those links will be up okay. there, so you don't have to try and scribble them down or anything now. That's great. We'll have them all out there. For and you. they're also on the PowerPoint, yes, and I'll give you the address right. for that, too. Uh, oh, we have something. There we go. Uh, okay, so some of the things that you'll want to think about are water. Food, those seem pretty obvious. We talked about a hand crank radio something with a tone alert. Um, those tone alert things on weather uh, depend on the settings that you have mm -hmm. for them. They can become annoying. 
So <laughs> I think you have to decide whether you want to get a, a notice on your radio that goes off at 3 o'clock in the morning, regardless, you know, you know that it's going to rain 5 inches or something. Uh, flashlight, extra batteries, first aid kit, a whistle, I think that's a good one, dust mm -hmm. mask, uh, towelettes. How do you turn on and off your utilities? Do you even know where those are in your library or in your home? Can openers for foods, local maps, sleeping bags or blankets, changes of clothing, chlorine bleach, and that's not just to use as a disinfectant, but you might need to use it in water, a uh, fire extinguisher, uh, more stuff might include matches, mess kits, uh, paper and pencil, books, games, puzzles. Uh, it's really just keeping children entertained. Uh, prescription medications and glasses, infant mm -hmm. formula and diapers, pet food, extra water, family documents. Again, I think this is another good idea. You can easily make copies of your insurance policies, IT, bank account records, and just keep them in one waterproof portable container. Most of that stuff doesn't change much over time. So if you just kind of made it a, uh, a plan to review it every January or something, you would be in great shape. So uh, you'd have it available. Cash, change, and just a word about cash. People think having cash on hand is important, mm -hmm. but don't have it in $100 bills. Have it in small no, bills, bills because it's more likely that you're going to need to give a dollar here or $10 here or something, not $100 bills. Uh, emergency reference material. Kids know some of these things, I hope, where your tornado room is, your shutoffs. If you have an egress, like a basement, how do you get out of it? If it's not through a door, do you have a window that you can get out of? Uh, gathering place, have you all agreed to meet at the big oak tree across the street, or where will you meet for your family? Family contacts for other people, so not necessarily your immediate family, but someone, someone else. First aid, CPR, cough etiquette, washing hands, uh, work contact numbers, the paperwork. These are the things that you'd want to have in your little pouch. Uh, pandemic preparedness. Now, you know, we've gotten warnings over this over the last couple years. Unfortunately, it hasn't really mm -hmm. turned out to be as dangerous as we thought it would be. But how do you care for the ill at home? What do you do for kids who are away from college? Um, are you stockpiling more than three days of food? And then here are loads of consumer resources. You may have a lot of typing to do. <laughs> <laughs> we expect to do that, yes. <laughs> but there's public health, as we said, Red Cross, Boy Scouts have great things, uh, the Citizen Corps, um, Volunteers and Police Service, um, uh, Centers for Disease Control, obviously that's part of the government, as am I, and we're all part of the National Institutes of Health. Uh, FEMA, that's really their job to be thinking about that. Uh, Medline Plus, which most of you may know is probably one of the primary sites that I normally promote because it has information on all kinds of things and also on disaster preparation. So um, what about training? You know, what if you want to attend some additional training? Well, I will tell you, in our region, our six-state region for the National Network Libraries of Medicine, we have been offering classes, and we've done them like every other month for several months. So right now we're on steps seven and eight of what we just talked about. So looking at your course services and looking at your access plan. So you can uh, check our schedule, which is located at the URL down here, which are EP classes. Or you at the top here, what's underlined is signing up for this class that's on January 12th. Now, if you're concerned about having missed steps one through six, we also have those webinars posted on our website. Oh, great. So, so you can actually get one. that at that schedule uh, area there, too. And here's what Medline Plus looks like. As I said, Medline Plus is your government website for consumer health resources, and we do have an area just for disaster preparedness and recovery, which has, again, loads of resources. Uh, ToxMap is, uh, also comes from the National Library of Medicine, and this uh, it actually has two components to it. One is super fun sites, or what we call lead sites. Uh, this particular one is for toxic release inventory. Mm -hmm. So I printed out the toxic release inventory for the state of Nebraska here. And each place that you see a little marking there 
is an event that has occurred at some place in time. And over then on the right hand side, you'll see those numbers uh, corresponding to those. And what that does then, you can go in there for more information and see, oh, what was released or uh, what might be the toxic uh, thing that I might need to be worried about. Now, if it's really big, obviously those things are going to be in the news, but you may find things here in your communities that you might not have been aware of, which might yeah. add to your risk assessment. There's lots of little things that you yeah, just don't get. Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> A lot known. depends on media. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I also want to mention these. Um, the National Network Libraries of Medicine in our region, the Mid-Continental Region, um, offers free access to Net Library. So if you go to this URL through our web page, we have three books that are specifically for disaster recovery and disaster recovery planning. Um, to get to this, as I said, you just go to our URL. There is no user or password required. And you can uh, look at these ebooks. They are not downloadable, so you'd have to look through them page by page, or you can go to a particular chapter and look at them. But again, it gives you an idea of the kinds of things you need to be planning for with your operations and facilities. And we would love for you to use these. I think these are kind of underutilized, and I uh, think they're a great resource. Our collection there actually includes about 100 books on technical and management topics for libraries, so we hope that you'll use them. They're always available. Um, and this is where I wanted to mention um, something that's recently been done. Um, Siobhan Champ Blackwell, who is also located in Nebraska at uh, Creighton, has put out this Nebraska response handout. So if you would, um, you can click on that, or actually you can go to this uh, URL that I have here at the beginning. And what this is going to do is provide a list of agencies in Nebraska for libraries to work with in developing planning and resource, planning and response resources. And what I have printed out here, I believe, is a, a map. It, you can't see the outline of Nebraska here very well. But these are libraries in Nebraska. So if you think about all the places that are potential places to be hubs in the event of an emergency, count yourself among them. Uh, and it looks like a lot, but honestly, I'm not sure how many of these libraries are prepared for emergencies. Mm -hmm. So if you're one of those libraries, uh, we will hope that you will begin to work with the other emergency entities in your community and uh, become one of those hubs. So what specifically can you do? Well, you can expand your medical and public library partnerships, and by this I mean if you have a hospital in your library, I hope that you are talking to your hospital librarian uh, if you're a public librarian and vice versa. Because we really think those alliances that come out of people working together are the best kinds of partnerships. So maybe they have resources that would be particularly uh, useful in the event of an emergency. Maybe one has a better facility or a more accessible facility. Or maybe you can just kind of agree to be partners, uh, you know, to back each other up in the event of emergencies. You can work with first responders. Part of that comes off that list that I just mentioned to you. Um, but you might also contact your fire department and your police department, for example. Uh, you can provide access to emergency management information resources, and I think we've given you a number of those today. Uh, involve the library in community planning. I I often think that city planners just forget the library. They just don't think of it as being something that can be particularly useful. And you have to, if you're in a public librarian, you have to drive home that point. That's your responsibility. Like what Omaha Public Library is yes. doing with the, the, the resources list. Yeah. You bet. You want to have a place at the table, so it's however you can make yourself bit, uh, valuable in doing that. And libraries can encourage people to take steps to prepare for emergencies. Well, then you're going to say, how can I do that? Well, you can organize community day events. And we have given you here 13 different ideas of what you might do. And oddly enough, you could almost do one of those every month if you wanted to. <laughs> uh, so you could do first aid planning. Uh, you could have someone come in and do CPR training, probably someone in your public health department or a Red Cross might be willing to do that for you. Medline Plus demonstrations, and uh, I'm raising my hand here because I'm happy whenever to do a webinar 
Uh, I can't always come to your libraries, but I can do a webinar as long as you have a computer with internet access and uh, a projector where people could see it in a class. Or you can just go and do a tutorial, which is available from Medline Plus, which you know may take about 10 minutes, but give people a lot more information than they've had before. Uh, there are disaster preparedness pathfinders, and by that I mean uh, uh, specific information with regard to disaster preparedness and journal articles that librarians have prepared. Uh, there's even a disaster preparedness listserv, and I didn't include that here, but if anybody's interested in that, let me know and I'll give you that information. Uh, you could do team building exercises, disaster preparedness for pets, uh, family communication plans, so, for example, do your children all have a cell phone? Or if they don't have a cell phone, can you get in touch with their school? Uh, again, what kind of communication do you have in place? City maps. You may not think that that's very important, but honestly, if you're not very familiar with your city, it might be very important. Uh, disaster kit giveaways uh, may include things like duct tape and plastic sheeting. Uh, disaster plan consultations. Uh, Survivor storytelling, uh, you can get to some of those, as I said, from our website. They're not recorded, but they are uh, they're written out. Uh, kids' books, reading, puppy shows, disaster scenarios, uh, relevant videos and movies. Uh, so probably not the Hollywood version, because those <laughs> may be a little disaster. Uh, way more disaster than there usually is, but little, you never know. Yeah. Mu much to them. <laughs> yes, exactly. But again, those are things you can think about. So this is our website, as I mentioned, our National Network Libraries of Medicine. So that's nnlm.gov, and EP is for emergency preparedness. And who better to leave you some words with, by failing to prepare, we are preparing to fail. I saw that on there. Yes. Yeah, very... <laughs> so I, I think apt words uh, regardless. So with that, I will uh, open it up for questions, or if we had any comments along the way that I failed to address, uh, please speak now. Let's see if we have anything. So does anybody yeah. have any questions? And again, if you want to get to our regional website where you'll find these Nebraska resources, that's actually, if you look at this uh, same URL here, it's nnlm.gov slash mcr, which stands for Mid-Continental Region. Uh, and that's where we have our resources for um, educational and training opportunities. Mm -hmm. That's where we've archived these prior trainings on emergency preparedness and where you can find information specific to our states. There we go. Okay. okay. Um, we do a question about where the PowerPoint slides will be. Oh, um, they well, are well, located on that website, actually. Okay. Let me repeat that for you. And maybe, uh, Krista, you could put it in the chat box, too. It's http colon slash slash nnlm.gov slash mcr. So that will take you to the front page of our Mid-Continental Region. And if you go to Education and Training Opportunities, which is a tab at the top of the page, and then look under online training. Uh, this will be under the online training page. So you'll see the PowerPoint that mm -hmm. I've given to you here. It's been posted. And the paper um, is under the emergency planning part of our page. And when we um, put, post the recording of this session, um, all of you who are attending will be sent an email letting you know the recording is available. And the link to the PowerPoint will be there as well. Great. When you are given that. Which yeah. will be either later today or sometime tomorrow when we have all this process through. Right. Uh, we have another question here. Um, oh, this has given me so much information. The Omaha Public Library is in the very beginnings of emergency preparedness. I'm wondering where is the best or least overwhelming, so to speak, place to start? <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is honestly, very overwhelming, actually. Yeah, you know, watching it all is. this, it is a little bit like, oh my God, I'm panicking. <laughs> I need to go home right now and make sure we have all those things in my house. You know, I, <laughs> I would say, first, if you're a library that's planning, start with this. If you're a person that's planning for your house, 
I would start by printing off one of the lists for, I think the Red Cross is a really good place to start, or FEMA, either one of those. But they have a basic list of kinds of things that you want to prepare for. And honestly, if you just honest, start by thinking of uh, food and water, and maybe you do that in, you know, give yourself a little project plan, if you will. Um, so you do that in January. Maybe in February you think about having a radio with batteries or getting a crank radio. Mm -hmm. Maybe in March you have, you make sure that you have blankets or sleeping bags for people in your family. Those would be home kinds of things that you would do. But the same thing is true for uh, planning for your library. Um, if you feel a little overwhelmed by this, again, why don't you put it on a monthly basis, maybe as part of a staff meeting. So my first step would be to do this little uh, pocket response unit thing. This doesn't take a lot of effort, but would at least get you started. And you can always add to it. It's not like this is laid in stone by any means. And then maybe go back to some of those earlier recordings that for the steps. And maybe you take one step each month for a year. You would be surprised at what you can do. I, I am a huge advocate of eating an elephant a bite at a time. You can't sure. do it all in one swoop, but if you break into smaller steps, you can certainly accomplish what it is that you want to accomplish. Great. Uh, oh, our commission staff said you did such a wonderful job that we have no questions. Thanks for this nice <laughs> presentation. <laughs> oh, I always love getting a compliment like that, so that's super. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity to share this information. And again, my contact information was uh, on the beginning of the PowerPoint, mm -hmm. but certainly you can get to it through the Nebraska Library Commission um, or by going to our website, nnlm.gov slash mcr. It's Marty McGee. Cool. Any other questions anybody has right now for us about this? Um, as I said, the PowerPoint and the recording will be posted up, so you may be able to get more information then on my watching it again. Um, and of course, if you do think of questions later, you know, call. Absolutely. <laughs> call, email, whatever. You bet. It doesn't look like anything urgent okay. is coming in at the Alrighty. moment. Great. Well, well thank you all for attending. I appreciate, uh, as I said, the opportunity, and I hope you go forth and prepare. <laughs> Thanks for a quick overview. <laughs> Overwhelming as it is, yes. Okay. <laughs> but that's what it is. It's a nice overview, a good start. Absolutely. Go back and start working on it, like you said, piece by piece. That is uh, yeah. definitely. Lots of thank yous. Okay. So um, thank you very much. Thanks very much, you, Marty, for coming Certainly. and talking to us about this. Um, and next week, we hope you'll join us. Our session for Encompass Live will be about, um, very specific to Nebraska, <laughs> actually, about internships. Um, internship grant programs the Library Commission has currently running, um, Cultivating Nebraska Librarians 2.0 Building 21st Century Skills Grant Program. And we're going to have some participating libraries who have had interns come in via this grant and talk about it and see how you can get involved in it in, um, for future ones. So hopefully okay. you'll join us next week, next week's Encompass Live. So thank you very much. And I just want to do a last check and see if any urgent questions came and in. And if you okay. didn't put your zip code in, yes. make sure you oh, put yeah. it we in here at the last minute. We did have some people that came in okay. late. Yeah, if you did, um, for the National Libraries of Medicine, you guys, yes. they, they keep statistics based on people who attended their sessions just via, based on zip code, mm -hmm. as far as where people are. So um, if you could, if you haven't already, if you could type into the question section just whatever your zip code is, um, we'll be just passing that information on so that they can have their statistics based on that. So um, Uncle Sam wants to know. <laughs> just wants to know where you are. Um, that's all. Exactly. So um, go ahead and take that in. If you haven't already, just type your zip code into the question section. Um, we'll leave it open so that people have time to do that. That sounds very good. So, all right. So if there's nothing else, then I think I we'll think that's wrap it, it up for this morning. Thank all you right. very much for attending, and we will see you next time. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye now.